Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 281. Why didn't I get that academic job? Or understanding the academic workplace. The vlog this week dialogues with our session last week on dark academia but it has a more precise trigger and focus. I received an email from a graduated PhD student filled with despair. Let me share some of that message with you. Quote, Hi Tara, I had a defeating moment recently when I just missed out on a dream job. It was a job application and interview for which I spent the better part of a decade preparing since I decided to enter academia. It was the first and only permanent level A job that I've seen in any of my fields. The whole experience left me second guessing whether I wanted to keep up the battle. Is there going to be a job for me in the end or is this all in vain? I've either been a casual research assistant, marker or tutor for seven years now and I finally saw an opportunity recently and interviewed for a permanent associate lectureship position in an enabling program in an Australian university. It was everything I had worked towards. I'd completed an enormous application, did a presentation for the panel and an exhausting hour and a half interview. The head of the panel called me a week later and said, you would make a great member of the team and the panel were all very impressed with your application. I actually placed you as the top applicant, but the panel convinced me that we should give the job to the staff member who was already doing it. I actually wrote that quotation down during the phone call because I couldn't process it at the time. The silver lining was the head of the panel said he wanted me on the team and he'd find something for me. Well, two months have passed since then and even though I've followed up twice, nothing came of it. So what's the point? End of quote. Thank you for that email. Thank you for the courage in writing that email. And we can hear the confusion and the pain and the rage in that email. And so I will reply to that message today. I'll use it as the frame for our discussion. And I want to reply with care, with kindness, with compassion, but also with truth. And there's some hard truths today. So in preparation for the vlog today, I assessed qual and quant, the studies around the world post-pandemic about employability for PhD students and PhD graduates. So I've got the data set in place to share with you today. But let's therefore start with some really tough truths. At least 40%, 4-0, at least 40% of the jobs advertised in universities are already filled. So that is exactly what our emailer had experienced. Applied for a job in good faith, someone was already occupying that role. So you have to apply for lots of jobs and not wonder, right, well, I've applied for one, why did it go badly? You need to apply for a lot of jobs because one in two jobs that you're going to apply for are already filled. And the problem you have is you don't know which one of the two is filled. Secondly, the emailer was waiting for an A-level post. And for my friends around the world, an A-level lectureship in Australia is equivalent basically to a junior lectureship role or an assistant professor role in other systems. Now, you won't see uh, these junior or lower level lectureships advertised anymore because the work that used to be in those roles has now been casualized. So why pay? Holiday pay, superannuation, teachers, teachers pension, benefits, depending on your national system, when you can simply pay by the hour. So entry posts in this form have now gone. Thirdly, the email talked about the stress of the long application and the long interview. To be honest with you, what the emailer describes is actually a very short 
application process compared to what is happening now. It is very, very common for people to have to go through day-long application processes, sometimes even two days of performative acts. You start to have long lists and then short lists that we'll talk about in a second. And the, much to my amusement, it's sort of a horrific gothic humour really, but the invention of completely arbitrary invented tasks. So you've done an application and then the interview panel invents new things for you to do. So could you write a one pager on this? Could you have a series of meetings with different people before we even get to an interview? Could you do a little video for us to have a chat about what you're interested in? All these bizarre little micro acts of performance before you even get to the real deal. And finally, as I'll talk about a great deal in the vlog today, I want to address directly the notion of the dream job. Being wedded to one job, one mode of employment is the path to madness. It's also the path to despair. So from not getting his dream job, my emailer finished his statement, it's a long email, statement to me with this last sentence, quote, I see that I'm going to spend the next 30 years in random jobs that I don't like in order to pay off a hex debt that I never needed. End of quote. We can all hear the desperation, the fear, the anger there. And I understand it and I acknowledge it. But depression and anger do not create change. Understanding the context of the workplace will create the change that you want to see. So the vlog today gives you 10 answers to the question, why didn't I get that academic job? Here are 10 answers, here's my first. Don't limit your potential to a dream job. Get a job that you can live with while you're awake. There are many parts of that email that upset me. I actually got very emotional in the office when I read it, I had a good cry, I was so upset for the person that they'd gone through all of this. But also there was a lot in the email that confused me. The notion of the dream job was really odd for me. In the same way when people talk about like a dream home, I've got a forever home, I've got a dream home. I don't really understand what that means. From my perspective, we have a responsibility to pay our bills. A house is just a house. It's a privilege to have shelter. Tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people around the world don't have the gift of a stable home, a stable sheltered environment. If you've got that, that is a blessing, that is a gift. And let's be honest, how do any of us really ever know actually what will make us happy? Really, what's gonna make us happy? What's gonna make us contented? You don't know because you don't know the options that are available to, it, to you, to all of us. Now, in my life, I have never ever thought of a dream job. I thought about the importance of getting a job, being in work, and being able to pay my bills. And remember, I've worked in four countries. I've worked in nine universities. I have left nations to get a job. So I've moved countries to be in work. And during my PhD, I got my first job. It was a 12 month job in a different country. So I had to move countries to get that first job for a 12 month contract with no chance of renewal. And then I had to jump countries again to get another short term contract in a regional Australian university. And then I jumped states again so I could get an inverted commas tenured job. And then from that job, I went to England to get a job. I went to Canada to get a job. I returned back to England to get a job and then came to Australia to get a job. Where I will be for my next job, I have absolutely no idea. So I've always had the mantra that if you are prepared to work anywhere in the world, you will always be in employment. And that's the point. If we're looking for permanence in any job, inside or outside university life, you are deluding yourselves. The job for life is over in universities, outside of them, it's over. So my emailer described, quote, spending 
the next 30 years in random jobs. End of quote. Now, here's one I prepared earlier. I've spent 30 years working in academic life. This is me. 30 years. Have they been random jobs? No. They have not been random jobs. Have they been dream jobs? No. No. Have I been able to live and pay my bills? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Have I taught some of the most amazing human beings in the world? Yes, I have. Oh, yes, I have. And have I produced research that I am proud of that has improved the world? Yes, I have. Wow. Am I proud of those 30 years? Yes, I am. No dreams. Gritty, brittle, often nasty, often confusing reality. So ponder your dreams. Ponder your dream jobs, then wake up and discover meaning and momentum. Not dreams, not permanence, meaning and momentum. Two, interview panels have plenty of choice in their selection of candidates. Now, you are in a competitive environment. We're all in an incredibly competitive environment. Hundreds of people are applying for jobs, great people. So you have to make your case rather than assume your case. Now, if you walk into a, a job interview process thinking, I've got this, I've got this, then you, you, you're lying to yourself. You are lying to yourself because you're assuming that the interview process is all about you. Actually, you're only a very small part of the interview process. You're forgetting that you're in a competition. There are tens, hundreds of thousands of astonishingly brilliant and remarkable people in the world. And that knowledge should make us humble. And that humility helps us. But we have to present our best self. It is an interview, so you've got to present your best self. But know that it's not about us. Not really. People are employed, not for who they are, people are employed because they solve a problem for the university. You being fabulous, I'm sure you are, but you being fabulous is not going to get you a job. You solving the problems of a department or a college or a faculty or a university, that will get you the job. Therefore, when you ask, why didn't I get the job? The answer is, you were not the best person for this job in this institution at this time. And understand that. Sit in that knowledge with its honesty. And that's why you know you've got to keep applying for lots and lots of jobs, not hope that a dream job will come along. 10 jobs, 20 jobs, 30 jobs, 100 jobs. Apply and you will get a job. But remember the cliches, don't put all your eggs in one basket get a job and your focus should be on getting into the system. Once you're in the system, you're able to move around the system. Apply for everything, get a job. Three, interview panels are cautious, too cautious. Because interview panels have such a choice and are really inexperienced in managing this degree of choice, the appointment processes that we're all going through at the moment are completely bonkers. And look, if you want to see that a panel's not really managing what it's doing, there are a series of proxies that you can monitor and go, all oh, right, inexperienced panel, they don't really know what they're doing. So the things you start to see are they're focusing on a long list rather than a short list. The moment you're going for a long list, it's like, can you pick the three people that you're going to shortlist? I mean, it's not hard, you know, don't, don't go eight, don't go nine, don't do a long list. Look at the applicants, do a shortlist. If they're doing a long list, they don't know what they're doing. My other personal favourite is they shortlist just about everybody that applies. I've been on panels around the world for, and of course that's been around the world because of COVID in the last six months, and I've been stunned how often 
everybody that applied for the job pretty well got shortlisted and interviewed. And why that's terrible is that instead of interviewing three people, which you can do in a morning or an afternoon, you're interviewing 10 or 15 people, which is two or three days. Okay, and then my other personal favourite that we're seeing at the moment is the creation of all these bizarre performative acts. Uh, you know, micro interviews, doing all sorts of really weird things. And my favourite example of this, which happened to me, so I can, <laughs> I can share this story, and it was about 13 years ago too, so it was a long time ago. And uh, I'd just gone through, and I got this job, by the way, I didn't take it for obvious reasons, but I had just gone through two days of an interview, two days of an interview, and on the last day, the final hour between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., I was shown into this room without windows, and I remember it was really like a bunker. It was just sort of grey, grey, grey concrete, right? And they put a pad, writing pad in front of me and gave me a pen. And this was the final performative act. And they said, they wanted me to write a strategy, okay? I want you to write a strategy for us about how you will ensure the survival of this department after a zombie apocalypse. True story. And remember, this was 13 years ago. Zombies were not as popular then as they are now, okay? So that is just that's just bonkers. You just got to call it. That's bonkers. It was so bonkers. When I got offered the job, I went, you know what? I can't work for a place that's that bonkers, right? So when we start to see the dinners, the lunches, the breakfasts, these multiple stakeholder meetings, people, why am I meeting these people, right? Now, in most North American processes, this is what we're seeing. One, two days of these performative events, okay? And Australian processes are starting to replicate this. So time spent with a candidate is being confused with efficiency and expertise. Because the argument is, I think, that, oh, right, if we can just spend enough time with the interview candidate, we'll break them. We'll get to see their real selves. Now, of course, this is nonsense. This is an employment process. This is a professional communication event. So what's simply required is not time, but clear headings about what the institution requires from this post, and then all the candidates assessed via those headings, completely professional process, and of course, an experienced panel that is able to read a CV. Now these days, <laughs> that seems to be quite a rare expertise. So we need to be clear about what the department or the university needs and not be greedy, not be overreaching in terms of the appointment. So, and we've all seen this sadly at the moment, expecting a junior lecturer to have, you know, 50 publications, 15 grants. And of course, my personal favourite for people that have just graduated from their own PhD, expecting them to actually have some PhD supervisions. And I have seen that in advertisements. So there is a desire to find the cheapest option available to solve the university's problems. And therefore, universities can be greedy, and they are being greedy at the moment because restructures have meant that tens of thousands of great people have lost their jobs, and a lot of people are very, very desperate. So institutions in this type of context can decide to behave ethically, or they can decide to run it like the Big Brother house, they can decide to run it like Game of Thrones. And in interview processes, you have seen situations, unbelievably, where candidates are pitted against each other. In the old days, you used to keep the candidates separate from each other to enable professional behaviour. Now we're seeing these poor candidates herded into a room, so they sort of fight it out amongst themselves. So your job is write the best application you can, and if you're not successful, know that it is not about you. It's about your capacity to fit, they call it university fit, be able to fit into that institution and solve these problems at this time. That's it. Four, crucial one, recognise degree inflation. A PhD is valuable, very, very valuable. And from my studies, qual quant, in the last couple of weeks, let me just confirm for you, most PhD graduates are in work, and they're in good work, really good work. 
So it's not a question of if I just stopped at my bachelor degree, everything would have been okay. Trust me, that's not the case because we have degree inflation. This is real and this is important. So employers can now choose. They can choose an honours student over a bachelor student. They can choose a master's student over an honours student. They can choose a PhD student over a master's student. So we can't, we've got to stop this either or thinking. So unemployment or a PhD, because the reality is so much more complicated than that at the moment, triggered by casualisation, but also by degree inflation. Every degree level you attain, your chances of being unemployed reduces and your chances of being employed increase. If you do not have a PhD, you will not get an academic job. That is the baseline requirement for academic life. Trust me, I shortlist. When I'm shortlisting, the first cut I make, the first group I remove, are the people without a PhD. So the PhD gives you access to apply for an academic post. It's no guarantee that that application will be successful or that you'll be successful in getting that job but you are improving your chances. So the PhD improves your chances of being in work. But a PhD is not a golden ticket. It's not a platinum American Express card preloaded with a million bucks, but it's a powerful degree. And it enhances your chance of getting work and then being able to stay in work. But no degree gives you guarantees. Five. Now, if I'd known this 25 years ago, what I'm about to tell you with number five, this would have changed my life. Okay, this is an important one. Five, be aware when applying for jobs with an internal acting appointment. Okay, let me explain what this means. Now, firstly, the challenge is most of the jobs you are applying for have someone acting in the role. So someone retires, someone resigns, and an acting person is put in that role. Okay, and that's common. That's really common. But the challenge that I'm talking about is as follows. In some university systems, a mate, a friend, a partner is put into an acting role, often with very few processes. So randomly, this person is put in that job. And once acting in the role, they've shown that they can do the job. And that competence is then used to offer the role to the person permanently. Now, I'm not saying don't apply for a job with someone acting in the role because you'd probably never apply for work, but go into the situation absolutely with your eyes open. The advertisement may be for legal compliance to show that they've had due processes, okay? So you know that this sort of fake process has occurred when you start to hear phrases like, and this is how the sentences start. After a rigorous international search, we've appointed Mike, who happens to currently work for us. So after a rigorous international search, we've appointed some random guy that's actually in the office three doors down. How amazing is that? And as you heard from our emailer, one member of the panel thought that he was the best candidate, but the incumbent was appointed. Okay, so my warning here is a really important one. Apply, give your application everything, but know that the incumbent always has the advantage, which leads to six. Beware the promises made through interview feedback or email notifications after the process. Now, remember that most academics have had absolutely no training in how to conduct an interview or to offer professional development, none. So our system, as we talked about last week, is the dark academic life. It's a place of ruthlessness, nastiness, brutalizing. We know that. So the problem is, and this is true, it is a terrible, terrible job to notify people that they were unsuccessful in attaining a post. As you heard from my emailer this week, people put their hearts 
and their souls and their hopes into this job application. They have a dream about themselves in the role and then one phone call, one email and that dream has gone. So the person given the job, uh, particularly if they're phoning up the people that were shortlisted, are trying to get off that phone call as quickly as humanly possible because it's just not pleasant. Now, one of the reasons that all these headhunters have now been hired is that so they can manage all this messiness and the complications of really disappointed, quite emotionally volatile people. And the emails <laughs> that you receive from these people, shall we say it together as a family, read something like this, quote, Thank you for your application. It was an incredibly competitive field and your application has not been successful at this time. End of quote. And yes, they cut and paste those sentences 20 times or 30 times or 100 time, times for each applicant. And when you ask for a little bit more feedback, you'll get that same message, but just with the sentences inverted. Yes, it was a competitive field, Thank you so much for your application. Okay, so on the phone, people want to get through uh, telling people they were unsuccessful as quickly as possible. So they will flatter you. They will flatter you. They will say phrases like, I would have hired you. You did a brilliant interview and an application. And my personal favourite, we'll keep your CV on file. Will ya? Now, all of this may be true or true-ish, but it'd be much better if actually honest feedback was offered, if the candidate asked for it. So a lot of people, they're so emotionally destroyed that they just want to get off the call themselves, the candidates, right? But I've always made a real offer to offer proper feedback. And I actually got this from my late husband, Professor Steve Redhead, who used to spend half an hour or an hour talking with people about their career and their applications. And I always try and do the same thing. And that is giving people the decency of spending time with the unsuccessful applicant. So talking about their CVs, offer areas of future development. Now people may shout, they may cry, they may be really angry at you and focusing the anger at you. And that's okay. It's important to absorb that if you can. But the right thing to do is to respect that emotion and move through the process. The challenge we have when we're offering feedback to people is that interview processes are confidential. So I can't tell you the real truth, which is you were beaten by a person who was better than you, and they were better than you on these 10 areas. And that's often the truth. I can't tell you that because it's a confidential process. But what I can do is focus on you as the unsuccessful candidate and talk about these areas can be improved. Work on these areas of your CV to render yourself more competitive. Now, this type of feedback will be increasingly rare because headhunters are now endlessly appointed to separate the panel from candidates. And this means that candidates are simply locked in despair and they have to sit in their rage and their disappointment and their confusion. And that's why I think I'm getting so many more emails this year from people I don't know, from people all around the world that are absolutely desolate and filled with rage and writing very long emails to me because I don't think they're able to express themselves in any other fora. So remember that the promises that are made on a phone call telling you that the appointment was unsuccessful are made by people who got the short straw and they're trying to get off that phone call as quickly as possible. Now the goal, if you can, and if you can stomach it, is to try and find a way to get feedback. And these days with the multiple barriers in place, that may not be possible. Seven. Don't romanticize the university workplace. Part of the challenge we have when we're all trying to help higher degree students into the workplace is that so many of you have this romanticized notion of a university. The experience of a university as a student, even if you have been a demonstrator or a tutor or done some lectures, that's completely different from the nightmare robust saturated experience of being a full-time academic. Now, I believe passionately in our universities. I have dedicated my life 
to international higher education. But you will never hear me say that this is a pleasant job. <laughs> You'll never hear me say, oh, it's a place of kindness and compassion. Most days, somebody says something absolutely unsayable to me. It says something absolutely dreadful. These are cruel environments. These are brutal environments. And sadly, the name-calling bullies do get on. They are successful. So if you want to see universities in their full horror, I draw you to one website, Universities to Fear. So whenever you feel yourself thinking how fantastic universities are, just put Universities to Fear into Google and have a bit of a reality check. So if you want to work in a university, I will do everything in my power to help you get there. But don't romanticize universities. Understand them and understand them as complex and pretty odd workplaces at the moment. Eight, recognize the diversity of jobs that are possible from a PhD. Now I need to continually state team, most former PhD students do not work in universities. Over half of the people that graduate from a PhD do not stay in universities. So they work outside of the university system. But I also want to recognise the diversity of roles that exist within higher education as much as beyond it. So you've got a PhD. I had five pages of lists of jobs that a PhD will allow you to attain. And let me just give you a few of them. I got a huge list. Uh, a permanent academic in a research intensive institution, a postdoc position, or should I say permadoc positions, uh, research scientists working on a contract in a university, a permanent academic working in a teaching only institution, contract teaching academics, teachers in further education or in the vet vocational sector, teachers in early childhood, primary and secondary education, working in university administration, that is the professional staff workplace, working in research development for startups, small, medium sized enterprises or corporates, working in user experience or information science workforce, that is helping businesses using research methods to make more informed business decisions, that's a big area, management consultants, entrepreneurs, working in the non-profit sector, policy research, science policy advisors, science communication specialists, or media and communication specialists. There's just a few. Therefore, recognize that even universities are very diverse and complex workplaces and know that your expertise, your research expertise, travels incredibly well to a diversity of environments, including a diversity of educational environments. Nine, get into the system. The greatest advice that I can give you about employment in higher education, if that is what you want, then get into the system. Seriously, just get into the system. If you're waiting for a dream job, if you're waiting for a particular type of contract, you are going to be waiting forever. The rules of assessing a CV now have changed, and they've changed radically even in the last five years. We know on panels that staff members have had to manage restructures, casual work, short contracts, soft money employment. And you know that's changed everything. Now, I am 52 years of age. I am that old. And I have never had one day out of work. I have worked every single day since I was 22 years of age in academic life. Incredible privilege. But can I just be honest with you? So I'm 52. In all that time, I have never had one day, never had one day, where I felt like I was in stable work. That I thought, okay, I'm stable. I've never had one day where I felt respected by my peers. And I've never had one day where I could actually <sighs> exhale and enjoy working in a university. Not one day. So what I've experienced is not a dream. 
but it is a passionate reality working around the world what a privilege is that what I have seen amazing I've met incredible people inspiring people great friendships and I've taught tens of thousands of the brightest people on this planet that have gone on and changed the world and I've produced research that I'm incredibly proud of and all of that happened because I didn't wait for a dream job I got an opportunity for a one-year contract and I moved countries to take it then I got another contract moved into a country town and because of all of that movement I have not been one day out of work and what I've seen is amazing but what I've seen is amazing because I had one rule as a very young PhD student and that is say yes to work get into the system now once you're in the system you can move around the system pay your bills keep learning add lines to the CV now the people who are hiring you like me know how incredibly tough it is to be in work at the moment so your capacity to hang on in this volatile system will be recognized so leave the dreams for when you're asleep get into the system and then hang on hang on into the system keep applying keep moving forward and survive and considering we've talked about survival let's go to the full and final sad truth to finish us off on this vlog 10 know that people lie to you during the interview process <laughs> so the sadness and the disgust expressed by that graduated PhD student who emailed me is completely understandable they couldn't understand what had happened through that application process, through the interview, through the feedback that was given. And the final bit of advice I need to offer you in answering that question of the vlog today, why I didn't get that academic job, is that people lie to you. People lie to you during the interview process. So advertisements appear when an internal candidate is already lined up for the job. Academics are cajoled onto an interview panel. Just remember, when you're being asked questions by people in an interview panel, we didn't write those questions. Someone from HR gave us those questions as we walked into the room and asked them. So we can't even write our own questions, okay? And often a very senior manager is the chair of the panel and they'll get the person they want anyway. Think about it. The vice chancellor or a deputy vice chancellor or an executive dean uh, is the chair of a panel. Who do you think is going to get that job? The person that the chair of the panel wants, they're going to get the job. But also, I want to be really clear here, and this is as someone who has held nine academic posts that I've accepted, I've probably got a hundred or so that I actually got, but the nine that I've actually accepted. In all those jobs, all nine jobs, I was lied to during the process. These are for the jobs I got. So in all those jobs I was lied to. Statements and promises were made to me to accept the job. And this has had a serious and indeed devastating impact on my life and my career and the people I care about. Now you'd think I'd learn, wouldn't you? <laughs> like nine jobs I've been lied to each time and I'm just not learning. I'm an absolute idiot. Uh, it is my weakness, I hope a strength as well, but I do trust people. I do trust people and that's why I'm telling you the truth now that maybe you need to trust people less than I have. And just to give you just a couple of examples. So the first job that I moved countries to take, right, they guaranteed to pay my very pitiful moving costs that were 970, I still remember it, 970 New Zealand dollars. That's all it cost to move me for one year. And they promised to pay that money, and you know what? They never did. They never did. And I was only on $30,000 for that year before tax, <laughs> before I've paid any rent, before I've even paid for food. And can I say, they didn't even pay for the flight back to Australia. So I worked the entire year, and I was $700 in the red, $700 I was carrying on a credit card at the end of the year. I was $700 down, having worked an entire year. Okay, so they promised to pay, they didn't, I was in the red. My second job was even worse. Now, at that point, I had three job offers, three job offers, three posh jobs, very good jobs. 
and the job that was really my fourth choice that I hadn't even really considered to be honest and was about to refuse created the biggest lie of all. So I had three really top in town posh jobs and this one and I really wasn't going to take this one at all and the head of department uh, and remember I was 24 and a very young 24 can I say and he was a 55 year old uh, professor and head of department to get me to come he promised me be and tenure before Christmas be and tenure before Christmas and he made this promise in the April of that year so with the promise of be and tenure before Christmas I took the job and I know this will come <laughs> As a surprise to you but that professor and head of department lied to me <laughs> he lied he lied to me it was a complete and utter lie and the course of my entire professional life was changed through that lie now luckily I made some fantastic friends taught wonderful students and I enjoyed the experience and I got a good expertise in regional development and regional universities that I write on and research to this day but the opportunity cost of the jobs I could have taken, wow, not calculable, huge. So if you are appointed to a university, someone will lie to you. If you're not appointed to a university, someone will lie to you. Now I know I'm being terribly negative, more negative than normal and I apologise for that. But you know what? If you haven't got the job, so in other words, you just they're not appointing you, they're flattering you to get you off the phone. They're hiding behind a headhunter's email. And if you do take the job, then they're gonna do everything they can to get you there as cheaply as possible. Now, I recently had a friend, and can I say he's a full professor. This is not a junior PhD student, a full professor that this happened to. He was promised as part of the sweetener deal to move countries, he was promised two PhD scholarships uh, for his students. He arrived and the scholarships didn't happen and just didn't happen and didn't happen and he ended up going and seeing his dean and said right well as part of the appointment process I was promised these scholarships and she said oh no 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 we promised to help you try and find the money to get those scholarships. There's one rule when you're thinking about job applications and accepting posts. If something is not written down, it does not exist. So if a promise is made, get it in writing, then it's real. So if someone is having a conversation with you, immediately go home or go to an office and write up an email and state on this date, at this time, this offer was made to me, I'm confirming this in writing, can you please confirm? And then you'll know if they are lying to you because they'll say, oh, look, no, or they'll ignore the email, right? So if it comes out of somebody's mouth, it doesn't exist. If it is in writing, it is real. So I know this has been <laughs> a very serious and a very negative vlog, and that's because I wanted to respond with seriousness for this great graduated PhD student. Now, this email did upset me, as you can see, and I do want to help but there were and there are no easy answers I can give here. There are simply some strategies that I can offer to you. Now I welcome further discussion, lots of commentary. Please write to me, happy to help in any way. Together we can make this system better with honesty and compassion and kindness. And so I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.